Hello everyone. Today we'd be discussing this research that comes under the heading of the learning approach. Now this particular study, this is a recent addition to our A-level psychology syllabus, that is AS psychology syllabus 990. This study was conducted in the year, was published in the year 2014. And if we talk about the core author over here, the core author for the study was Fagan. And if you see the says Fagan at all, that means it wasn't just Fagan along with Fagan, they were other people there too. So taking this study ahead, before we get started, before we get started with this particular study, I'd want us all to have a closer look at the title of the study. If we read through the title of the study, this says, Positive Reinforcement Training for a Trunk Wash in Nepal's Working Elephants, Demonstrating Alternatives to Traditional Elephant Training Techniques. Now, let's read this again. Positive reinforcement training for a trunk wash in Nepal's working elephants, demonstrating alternatives to traditional elephant training techniques, right? Now, there are three important things that I'd want all of us to pick up from here, because this is what we'd be focusing on, at least at the beginning. So, number one, this study has to do with positive reinforcement. I'll explain you what positive reinforcement is. Number two, the method that would be used over here would be uh, using SPR, that is uh, secondary positive reinforcement. And through that method, we'd be trying to figure out if it is possible to help elephants uh, uh, through the trunk washing procedure without any sort of negative reinforcement. Remember, this is positive reinforcement. Demonstrating an alternative, demonstrating an alternative to the traditional elephant training techniques that were used in Nepal back then. So before we even proceed, I'd want you to give this a read. If you're interested, uh, this is about Dr. Ariel Fagan. That's her full name. She uh, graduated from the School of Veterinary Medicine in 2013. Dr. Fagan became a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Behavior, the highest level of veterinary behavior special speciality degree that is possible. She lectures in the US and internationally both. Now taking this study ahead, uh, as you all are aware, when we get started with the study or when we're starting off a study, the first thing that we are to take into account is the psychology that is being investigated. Likewise, uh, if we talk about this particular study and we talk about the psychology that is being investigated over here, I'd expect you all to read through this slide and the next two slides very carefully. Now, there are five different aspects of the psychology being investigated that we'd be discussing here. To begin with, we'd start off with operant conditioning. Number two, we'd speak about for primary and secondary reinforcers. Number three, we'd speak about shaping. Number four, we'd speak about behavioral chaining. And number five, we'd speak about secondary positive reinforcement, also referred to as SPR. Now, to begin with, or rather say, before we even begin, uh, the uh, when we talk about this uh, psychology being investigated, this is pretty uh, important when it comes to the CIs as well. This has been a very popular question that the examiner keeps on uh, testing students on. You could typically expect a three marker or uh, you could get a five mark question on this as well. So about the psychology that is being investigated through this particular study that was conducted by Fagan A. All, Fagan et al. in 2014. Number one, the concept of operant conditioning. Now, what does the word conditioning over here refer to? When we speak about conditioning, we are talking about uh, using explanations towards why individuals behave in a particular manner or explaining how individuals are behaved in a particular manner through different actions, right? Now, operant conditioning plays a significant role in both human and animals, and it is widely used in various educational, clinical, and training settings. It is a type of learning process in behavioral psychology that involves strengthening or weakening behaviors based on their consequences. This is important. It is a type of learning process. It's a type of learning process in behavioral psychology that involves strengthening or weakening behavior based on their consequences, based on their consequences. This holds importance over here. Now, when we talk about an individual's behavior being shaped based on the consequences, what does it mean? When we perform behaviors that have a good consequence, we're more likely to repeat it. Psychologists would state that this behavior has been reinforced. Positive reinforcement might include food or praise. Another type of reinforcement is negative reinforcement. 
let me just highlight this in with a different color so that you're able to differentiate. When something unpleasant is removed, removed or, un or avoided in, in response to a stimulus. Now, examples of positive and negative reinforcement. When we speak about positive reinforcement, an example could be you rewarding uh, someone you could you 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 rewarding let's just say a particular child if a you are if you ask a child to uh, do something and the child does it and you get the child sweets that is an example of positive reinforcement because you are strengthening that particular behavior right you're strengthening a particular form of behavior being uh, uh, you're strengthening that particular form of behavior through positively reinforcing that behavior, right? Now, the child might want to redo what the child has been rewarded for, right? Con uh, and on the other hand, when we speak about negative reinforcement, negative reinforcement has to do with with uh, when when something unpleasant is removed or avoided in response to a stimulus, right? Now, for instance, uh, uh, someone walks... Uh, if, if, if a child is not ready to wear a jacket while walking out of home, you let the child walk out, the child walks out, the child feels cold, the child comes back, and then you uh, help the child with the jacket, right? So that would be an example of negative reinforcement. Why would this be an example of negative reinforcement? Because you are helping, you're helping the child remove something unpleasant or avoid something that has that is unpleasant. In this case, it was the child feeling cold, right? So we spoke about the examples of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And uh, when we talk about operant conditioning, through operant conditioning, the idea is that individuals would behave voluntarily, there would be voluntary behavior, and this behavior would be reinforced through positive and negative sanctions through positive sanctions and through or through negative sanctions an example of positive sanctions over here would be someone being rewarded if you reward someone they repeat that behavior or through punishment now taking this a step further and let's talk about primary and secondary reinforcers now we spoke about positive reinforcers and negative reinforcers right now we speak about primary and secondary reinforcers do not get confused between them this is positive reinforcement this is primary reinforcement okay now when we speak about or as we speak about positive reinforcement there are also primary and secondary reinforcers primary reinforcers fulfill a direct biological need now primary reinforcers my dear they fulfill a particular direct biological need an example would be a treat for a dog or sweets for a child secondary reinforcers have no intrinsic value to the organism but they can be exchanged for a primary reinforcer or they become associated with a primary reinforcer examples including include using a clicker when trying to train a dog or offering money to a human when we speak about the difference between primary and secondary reinforcers here, primary reinforcers, like this says, it fulfills a direct biological need of an individual, fulfilling a direct biological need of an individual. For instance, if uh, you offer candies to a child, if you offer chocolate to a child, that would be an example of a primary reinforcer, right? Now, Secondary reinforcers, what are secondary reinforcers? Secondary reinforcers are something that wouldn't directly hold value. But then again, if you associate, the important term over here is associate. If you're associating this primary reinforcer, the secondary reinforcer with the primary reinforcer, that might again result in that child wanting to behave in that particular manner, right? It's more like the primary, re uh, the primary reinforcer, like I said, could be you giving a chocolate to a child. A secondary reinforcer could be you, uh, you, 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 uh, uh, saying, hey, good boy. You saying good boy to the child, and then handing over, or a good girl, and then handing over that chocolate to the child, right? So the primary reinforcer over here could be an example of a child receiving a chocolate, and a secondary reinforcer could be the verbal cue that the child gets from you. Like I said, could be a good boy, could be a good girl. And if you try associating between, uh, associating these uh, to both of these together, it's more like a child does something good. You'd be like, hey, you're a good boy. And the next thing the child expects is getting that chocolate. Now, what you've done is you have 
formed and you formed an association between the primary reinforcer and the secondary reinforcer. So as soon as the child hears good boy, the next thing the child expects from you is receiving, receiving a chocolate, right? So we know what operant conditioning is. We know what primary and secondary reinforcers are. Taking this ahead, if we move on, let's talk about this concept of shaping, which again is uh, would come under the heading of the psychology that is being investigated. Shaping is a technique that utilizes the idea of operant conditioning, right? Spe especially the reinforcement part, especially the reinforcement part to refine the behavior of an organization. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, an organism, not an organization, right? Now, shaping is a technique that utilizes the idea of operant conditioning. It specially reinforces a, a particular behavior through by refining it, right? Now, for instance, if we are, uh, if we, if we, if we uh, let's just say, if, if you talk about a child sitting for any particular test, right? So let's say if there's a child who's studying for the AS psychology exam. And the exam is of, uh, let's just say it's a, it's a school test of, let's say, 60 marks. And uh, initially, you'd be, uh, you initially you'd be like, hey, if you score 70%, you'd get this particular reward, right? And then initially, you might as well be ready to reward the child when the child scores 70%. But slowly and gradually, you'd try to raise this bar, right? The next thing you'd expect the child you're actually shaping the child's behavior right you are making the child uh, perform even better the next time you might be uh, you might want to reward the child when the child scores 80 percent and then 90 percent and then could be 100 percent too right so shaping is a technique that utilizes the idea of operant conditioning right you're setting the bar higher every time you're setting the bar higher every time right Shaping is a technique that utilizes the idea of operant conditioning, especially the reinforcement part, you reinforcing behavior to refine the behavior of an organize, uh, organism. When an organism is attempting to learn a new behavior, there will be a variation in the quality of attempts, right? If you, if I mean, if I stick to the same example that I just gave you, uh, not, the, not the best of example, but this is just something that occurred to me right now and it pretty much uh, works over here, right? So. If, if you speak about a child uh, who is studying for psychology uh, for the first time, the child, uh, like I said, initially you set the bar low and then slowly and gradually you expect the child to be scoring higher and higher and higher. What you're doing is you're raising the bar and helping the child move towards perfection. So when an organism is attempting to learn a new behavior, there will be a variation in the quality of attempts. The attempts that are better ones that bring the organism Closer to the overall goal are rewarded. Ultimately, rewarding these behaviors at a behavior, ultimately rewarding these better attempts shape the behavior and mean that organism is more likely to keep repeating the ones closest to the final goal. So if you keep on raising the bar, that would eventually lead to the giants, giant, preparing itself for herself. Now we spoke about operant conditioning, we spoke about primary and secondary forces. We spoke about shaping and number four, we speak about behavioral training. Now, I'm just explaining you these terms uh, without linking it to this
like riding a bicycle, the height of it was not. That is stared then that is not. This is like However, the history is not trying to explain that the line comes. The is just one spot. So this is that in This study is about the image. This study is about how an alternative technique to the typical traditional technique that is being used to help elephants with trunk motion. Now, why the trunk motion? Like I said, when they found their models, elephants have been elephants have been getting, getting, getting tuberculosis, right? Now, when you talk about tuberculosis, tuberculosis in a single infant has tuberculosis or TB, that can be more dangerous because that elephant, uh, because TB is not only dangerous for that particular animal itself, but TB is also seen to be uh, dangerous for other elephants, or this could even be contacted by humans, right? So. Back in uh, back in 2012, back in 2012, the United States and Animal Health Association. Back in 2012, the United States Animal uh, United States Animal Health Association. They came up with uh, a suggestion. They uh, came up with a guideline that these particular elephants they should be tested annually for tuberculosis. Right in 2011, a guideline. And according to this particular guideline, these animals should be tested on, uh, tested for tuberculosis annually. Now, how is it that these animals could be tested for uh, tuberculosis? Usually, a sample of their mucus is taken, and for that they need to uh, take 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 this from. Uh, for that they may need to make the uh, make the elephant go through a trunk washing procedure, right? Trunk washing procedure of the elephant. So typically what used to happen was the, uh, the trainers or the people, uh, mehouts as we'd call them, they would use uh, aversive stimuli. They would punish animals or they would punish these elephants to be able to take that sample. However, recently uh, there have been certain steps, certain measures taken through different organizations for the welfare of animals. And it has been, uh, it has been, uh, they, they, they're encouraging uh, different organizations. They're encouraging uh, uh, the trainers or the mehouts to use positive reinforcers instead, to use positive reinforcers instead, so that 
uh, animals or elephants in this case could be kept away from negative uh, uh, reinforcers or aversive stimuli or from punishment, right? So traditionally in Nepal, captive, let me just raise this. Traditionally in Nepal, captive elephants are given free unlimited contact with their handlers. Now we referring to these handlers as mehouts, right? And elephant behavior is managed using punishing. Like I said, traditionally, typically what happens is you use punishment as a measure through which you could control the behavior of an animal. This form of operant conditioning relies on unpleasant stimulus such as pain or fear to shape behavior. You could, you could, you could punish the, uh, uh, punish the animal or you could uh, get them feared from that or you could you could threaten them threaten to punish them which might result in them behaving the way you'd want them to behave but then again if you're punishing them that's not right you're harming the animal right if you are threatening them for punishment you're psychologically harming you're distressing the animal right so one type of punishment used to shape elephant behavior is the pain inflicted by a bamboo stick we're talking about Nepal over here and this was referred to as the kocha so a pointed bamboo stick was used to uh, inflict pain to these uh, animals to ensure that they're behaving the way they're expected to behave right now one type of punishment used to shape elephant behavior is the pain inflicted by a bamboo stick known as a kocha however because of concerns because of concerns for captive animal welfare and keeper safety. Now, there are concerns about the captive animal, the animal under custody. And there are concerns about the keepers or the mehouts or the trainers uh, safety as well. You know, animals are huge. They can, uh, they could, they could be potentially dangerous. They could cause a lot of harm to their trainers. There's, in there's increased interest in reward-based training. Now, there's increased interest in reward-based training that is positive training. Now, I would want to stop over here and take you back to the title of the study, right? Before that, let's read this once more so that we could connect it easily with the type title of the study. Now, one type of punishment used to shape elephant behavior is the pain inflicted by bamboo stick. However, because of concerns for captive animal, concerns for captive animal welfare and keeper safety, there's increased, inter in increased interest in reward-based training that is positive reinforcement or positive training. So isn't this an alternative? Isn't this an alternative to the usual typical method? This is what I'm talking about. Positive reinforcement training for a trunk wash in Nepal. You know why uh, the trunk wash now, right? Because this could help the, uh, the, 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 the management or the trainer or the mehouts to uh, collect a sample. And why collect a sample? To collect a sample so that, so that they could uh, test the, uh, uh, the animal, the elephant in that, in this case for tuberculosis TB, right? Why? Uh, the testing and the testing because like I had initially said in 2012 the USAHA that is United States Animal Health Association they uh, published a guideline according to that guideline these animals should be tested and moreover uh, they were tested so that uh, they could they could they could be identified just in case they have uh, had uh, tuberculosis and why the identification the identification because if you're not if you do not know that a particular elephant has uh, uh, tuberculosis, that a particular animal might lose his or her life and could be uh, potentially dangerous for other elephants around and even humans. So positive reinforcement training for a trunk wash in Nepal's walking elephants, demonstrating alternatives to traditional elephant training techniques by the Mehouts. This was typically using this word. this was typically aversive stimuli being used when they were punished they were punished or they were threatened to be punished which was usually done through a bamboo stick which is referred to as a kocha right now taking this ahead this is where we were 
In particular, positive reinforcement methods have been shown to improve the psychological well-being of elements. Psychological well-being of the elements. See, physically you're harming them. That's one thing. Number two, you're psychologically harming them too. You, you're distressing them because they know for a fact if they make a mistake, they'd be punished, right? Of course, uh, if, if, even if we talk about humans, we don't like, if you're making a mistake, uh, we, we wouldn't, we, we'd want to be given a second chance than being uh, punished, right? Likewise, these... Uh, uh animals these elephants they were uh it was causing them a lot of psychological harm causing them a lot of distress so using positive reinforcement methods could get your could help you get your job done without psychologically harming these elephants now we're talking about uh, all of this under the heading of the psychology being investigated. There were five different elements that I had said we'd be taking into account. Number one, we had spoken about operant conditioning. Number two, my dear, we spoke about primary and secondary reinforcers. Number three, we, we spoke about the concept of uh, shaping. Number four, we spoke about behavioral chaining, one step leading to another, to another, to another. And towards the end, now we talk about secondary positive reinforcement. Now, what is secondary positive reinforcement? Before we proceed with this, try recalling what we had discussed uh, while discussing uh, uh, secondary reinforcers, right? Now, secondary positive reinforcement, this is one form of reinforcement training. And in this approach, animals are trained to link specific sounds with food reward. And these sounds are referred to as markers or sound markers. So you are talking about two different type of reinforcers here, see? This reinforcer, this reinforcer, right? This is the primary reinforcer. This is a secondary reinforcer, reinforcer, yeah? So, Secondary positive, uh, re, uh, secondary uh, positive reinforcement, S P R. Learn this. Secondary positive reinforcement. That is S P R. Right now, give this a read again. Focus on these two things that I've marked. Right. One form of positive reinforcement training is called secondary positive reinforcement training. In this approach, animals are trained typically to link a specific sound with food rewards. And these sounds are referred to as markers or sound markers. Once the animal learns the relationship between these markers and the food rewards, so again, you are creating an association. So if, uh, if I put it in a simplistic manner, you ask the animal to do something, uh, you ask the animal to do something, the animal does it, you would initially use a particular sound to uh, to, 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 to uh, give the animal the cue that the animal did what he or she was, what it was uh, expected to do, which would be associated with a food reward, right? Now, usually what happens is you are, uh, usually or typically when we talk about using positive reinforcement, you just use food rewards. So over here, along with food rewards, you're forming an association with a particular uh, or a specific sound, right? Now, Using a sound marker is more effective. Using a sound marker is more effective than just giving a food reward because the marker precisely signals to the animal when it has correctly performed the desired behavior. Whereas there is a delay in preparing and delivering the food. To maintain the connection between the secondary sound and primary food reinforcer, food rewards are still provided at intervals. Now, again, if you could link this with the example that I gave you earlier about uh, you asking a boy or a child to do something, the child does it and you'd be like, hey, you're a good boy. You know, the moment the child hears you're a good boy, the next thing the child expects is getting a chocolate in return. I don't know if I had said chocolate or sweets, whatever it was. So again, when you talk about secondary positive reinforcement, we are talking about an association between the positive reinforcer and the uh, the positive, I'm sorry, the primary reinforcer, the primary reinforcer, uh, the primary reinforcer and the secondary reinforcer. So we spoke about uh, these five different uh, uh, aspects or elements that have to be uh, understood well and later on applied to this. And bear this thing in mind, 
Uh, yes, you could possibly get a question on the psychology being investigated uh, from the study by Fagan et al. in 2014. So you, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd want you all to prepare a three mark answer for this at least. Now taking this ahead, let's move on and discuss the background of the study. So ensuring the health of captive elephants, ensuring the health of captive elephants is crucial and diagnosing and treating the illness plays a vital role in animal welfare. I'm sure you'd all agree ensuring the health of captive elements, uh, elements, I'm sorry, elephants is pretty crucial. And at the same time, diagnosing and treating the illnesses plays a very important role when it comes to the welfare of an animal. Now, to avoid traditional methods like punishment, avoiding traditional methods like punishment, like I said, using the kocha that was a bamboo stick that was typically used, a pointed bamboo stick that was typically used in Nepal. Fagan et al., that is, and others, explored the use of SPR training to teach elephants a trunk washing procedure. Now, they used, they explored the usage of SPR training. SPR is secondary positive reinforcement training to teach elephants a trunk washing procedure. Why teach them this trunk washing procedure? Because this would help them gather their sample to test for tuberculosis. This procedure aims to maintain their well-being and the researchers wanted to see if SPR training could be effective in encouraging elephants to voluntarily and reliably participate in this activity. So this research was conducted to see the effectiveness or the efficacy of using the SPR technique and to see if this could help elephants voluntarily and reliably uh, rely, uh, reliably participating in the activity. What activity are we talking about? We're talking about this trunk washing procedure activity, right? Now, while SPR, while SPR training had previously proven effective with some non-human uh, primates such as antelopes, such as giant pandas, there were no studies. I keep on highlighting this so that you guys are with me. So there were no studies testing its efficacy with elephants before this research. So this, my dear, was first of its kind when it came to testing elephants. Uh, okay, this wouldn't. So, so this was first of its kind when it came to testing SPR on elephants, right? First of its kind by Fagan et al. in 2014 in Nepal, right? Now, the advantage, the advantage of using SPR lies in its ability to shape the behavior of captive animals contributing to their overall health and well-being. Now, contributing towards their overall health, keeping them safe from TB and their well-being by using positive reinforcers, rewarding them. Now, in this specific study, the focus was on using SPR as a method for detecting tuberculosis in elephants, a serious respiratory disease that poses a significant threat to the captive elephant population and can be transmitted between animals and humans. So this could be dangerous for the elephant itself. At the same time, this could be transmitted to other animals as well as humans. Now, do you realize the significance of this research? Do you realize the significance of being able to have an, uh, a, a, a proper accurate sample? A sample could be achieved, obtained rather through this trunk washing procedure. Tuberculosis is best detected through a trunk wash method, but getting elephants to perform this correctly can be challenging, leading to many samples being inadequate for testing. So you ought to have an adequate sample to ensure that you could test these elephants well to ensure that they do not have TB, if they do have TB to work towards uh, treating them, right? Because this could be fatal as well. So this was the background of the study, taking this ahead. 
Figani all highlighted a situation where the SPR method could be highly beneficial. So they highlighted a situation where SPR method could be highly beneficial. Collecting sputum. Sputum is thick lung mucus. I'm sure everyone knows what mucus is. From elephants for tuberculosis. In places like India and Nepal and the USA, estimates show that 11% to 25% of captive elephant population may be tested positive for TB. Therefore, it is crucial to be able to test elephants safely. The most effective way to do this is by examining a sample of sputum from the elephants from the TB causing bacteria using a procedure known as trunk wash. Before the study, researchers had reported Significant challenges in obtaining high quality trunk wash samples for TBing, for TB testing, right? Now, uh, we, we just spoke about how in India, Nepal, and USA, around 11% to 25% of the elephant population are tested positive for TB. And this could be transmitted to other animals and to humans as well, right? Now, taking this ahead, a whopping 22% a whopping 22% alone are thought to be affected in Nepal, according to the Elephant Care International in 2011. Elephants with TB can show various signs from no obvious symptoms to weight loss, coughing, difficulty breathing, lack of appetite, and even nasal discharge. Now, we just spoke about how Feganiol had highlighted a situation where SPR method could be highly beneficial. The idea is to collect a sample that contains sputum that is thick lung mucus to test them for TB. Why so? Because in places like Nepal, India and US, around 11% to 25% of the elephant population is being tested positive for TB. And for Nepal alone, it is 22%. That's quite a lot, right? Taking this ahead, let's move on towards the aim of the study. Now, uh, before I could move on towards the aim of the study, what I've done is I've tried to add a couple of questions uh, that uh, are similar to, <coughs> sorry, I've tried to add a couple of questions that are similar to the uh, questions that you get in your CIs. Now, about the aim, uh, you would be, uh, you could possibly get a question on the aim too, and it's, if you do get one, it's usually of two marks. Now, the aim of the study was to see whether free contact the aim of the study was to see whether free contact traditionally trained elephants can be trained to participate in a trunk wash by using positive reinforcement. Or, I mean, you could write it through this. I mean, you could like write this. If you're getting this question, you get two marks or you could write this, they both work. Now, or to investigate whether using secondary positive reinforcement training would be effective on elephants in Nepal to participate voluntarily in a trunk wash to aid tuberculosis testing or TB testing. Now you write this or you write this, you get marks either ways. Taking this ahead, I hope the aim of the study is uh, clear uh, and uh, everyone has understood the aim of the study. Now uh, let's, let's, let's uh, step into the study finally. When we talk about this particular study, uh, what particular research method was used over here? Uh, this study could be referred to as a controlled observation or a structured observation. Now, why a controlled observation? Or before we even proceed, I'd like you all to, uh, I'd like to remind you all about what a controlled observation is and what a structured observation is. A controlled observation is typically, you use the term controlled observation typically when you have certain aspects, certain elements within the environment that are controlled, right? Now we talking about the study that was being conducted on elephants, right? Elephants, they weren't elephants that were picked from the wild or from the jungle. They were elephants who were uh, captive already. They were elephants that were captive already. They were elephants who were uh, living in their stables and uh, their, 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 their uh, environment wasn't really disturbed, right? Now, when we talk about the environment, uh, concern that could be raised over here could be that, hey, that's not... Uh, the typical environment where elephants are supposed to be. I understand that. I totally agree to that elements, uh, elements, sorry. Elephants are supposed to be in the wild. Nonetheless, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize on over here is that these uh, elephants were not uh, picked up from the wild or from, from the jungle, especially for this study. They were where they were, right? So they were 
uh, living in this uh, stable even before this research was uh, uh, thought of or was uh, conducted or this data from this research was being collected. So we would refer to this as a controlled observation because uh, the elephants over there, their routine, I mean, as much as the researchers tried uh, their level best to uh, not uh, uh, change their routine, uh, especially when you talk about their um, grazing sessions. Nonetheless, there were certain elements that were controlled over here. So it would be better to refer to this particular research as a controlled observation. Now, this was a controlled observation involving a small group of elements, a small group of elements, elephants, I'm sorry, a small group of elephants, a small group of elephants. Does this ring a bell? Does what the findings of this research be generalizable to the wider elephant population? Question mark. Would it be generalizable? The findings would they be generalizable? Remember, for the findings to be generalizable, you need to ensure that the sample that you're collecting data from is representative of the target population, right? Until and unless your sample is representative of the representative of the target population, your findings cannot be generalizable. So this was a control observation involving a small group of elephants living in captivity who were trained over a period of weeks. The researchers watched the elephant's behavior in response to a specific stimulus and used a behavioral checklist to record the elephant's responses. Now, when we talk about this behavioral checklist being used over here, this particular research might also be referred to as a structured observation, right? Now, there were uh, a number of uh, behaviors that were, uh, that these, uh, uh, that these elephants were uh, uh, checked upon, or there were certain behaviors, there was a behavioral checklist that, uh, through which the researchers were actually collecting data. So, uh, where was I? The researcher watched the elephant's behavior in response to a specific stimulus and used a behavioral checklist to record the elephant's responses as a percentage pass, as a percentage pass. Now, this rings a bell again. Are we talking about quantitative data, quantitative data being collected? So this means the study can also be described as a structured observation. So this particular study, if you talk about the research method and design of the study, this would be uh, best referred to as a control observation or a structured observation, right? Now, a typical mistake many students uh, make is uh, that, 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 that uh, I mean, they usually do this when it comes to designing a study in paper too, but uh, I think it's better if I clarify it right away. Many students, they refer to every course study as an experiment. Kindly do not do that. Don't do that. When you talk about an experiment, an experiment has to have uh, an independent variable and a dependent variable. Unless there is no independent variable or dependent variable, unless there isn't any independent variable that is being manipulated, you cannot check on the effects it has on the dependent variable. So do you see any IV over here? Do you see any DV over here? No, you don't, right? Not so far, you wouldn't even ahead, right? So let's not refer to this as an experiment. Let's refer to this as a controlled observation and a structured observation. Taking this ahead, and I'd like you all to go through the uh, strengths and the weaknesses on control observations and structured observations from your uh, research methodology booklets and try to apply them while on this particular study as well. Taking this ahead, moving on, talking about the sample. Sample, this, this study included five female elephants. Female elephants, right? Now, again, the generalizability of the findings could get questioned over here. Four of them were juveniles. What does the word juvenile over here mean? Younger elephants or baby elephants. And one of them was an adult. So the study included five female elephants, right? Uh, researches that are conducted on humans. If a research conducted uh, is conducted on uh, females only, we typically refer to as a, it as a gynocentric research. And research that only has males uh, as participants, we typically refer to that research as an endocentric research, right? So this study included five female elephants, four of them were younger baby elephants, and one of them was adult. All were housed at the same elephant stable at Nepal, in Nepal. They were all 
captive at the same elephant stable in Nepal. The juveniles were between five to seven years old and had been born at the stable. So that was their home. That was where they lived, right? Even before this research was conducted, like I mentioned earlier, for uh, just because this research was being conducted, they didn't really pick these animals up from the jungle, from the wild and bring them uh, to collect data. They were where they were. However, the other little film was estimated to have been in around 50, in her 50s. Now, uh, they were all females, four of, they were all females, there were five in total, four of them were uh, children, but they were baby elephants, they were juvenile elephants, one of them was an adult. Uh, if you talk about the age, that uh, age brackets, the younger elephants, that is majority of them, they were between five to seven years old. However, the adult elephant was in her 50s, right? The young elephants uh, that were, or the juvenile elephants, they were all born in the same stable. Now, a couple of possible questions that you could be asked on this. You could get a question that says, identify two features of the sample used in the study, right? Any two and you get two marks. There have been uh, questions in the past papers before where, uh, uh, where students have had three mark questions on identifying, just identifying the features of a sample too. So yeah, you cannot miss on this. Number two, suggest one problem with the sample used in the study. Oh, there are ample of problems here. The first one to begin with, uh, uh, they were only female. The likelihood of the findings being applicable to male elephants might be questioned. They were all from the same elephant stable in Nepal. So again, there were more of younger elephants than older elephants. So just pick up anyone, suggest one problem. Now, a typical mistake many students make is they would, now just because you know that there are a couple of uh, uh, problems over here, what many students tend to do is they'd start uh, they'd start uh, writing multiple problems. No, don't do that, please. You have been asked to write down one problem. You might as well stick to this one problem, right? Now, a frequently asked question over here is how do we score a two? Uh, how do we score two marks over here when we're writing down one problem? So you get the you write down the uh, uh, you get the first mark for identifying the problem. You get the first mark for identifying the problem or identification, and you get the second mark for linking it to the specific study, linking to the specific study. So you do that, you'd get two marks, right? Now, taking this ahead, the elephants were selected by staff at the stable using the following criteria. So they were selected by staff. Do you realize one more thing? Also, there was a criteria over here as well. So do you realize uh, these animals that were just present, they like, I have said it twice earlier, the, uh, they weren't they want, uh, picked up from the wild or from the forest. In that case, uh, in that case, in that case, in that case, uh, do you, do you, I forgot the point I had in my mind. So, yeah. I'd talk about it when it comes in my mind again. So the elephants were selected by the staff. Oh yeah, the, the 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 sampling, right? You could possibly get a question on the sampling technique that was being used over here. It is an opportunity sample. It is an opportunity sample, right? So an opportunity sample, my dear, has its own advantages, has its own disadvantages. Read through them, revise through them, and then try linking them to the study so that if you're getting a question on this in paper two that is linked to the sample and the sampling technique, you could answer it well. So the elephants were selected by the staff using a particular criteria. So there's a particular criteria that was set. And based on this particular criteria, these elephants, these five uh, uh, female elephants were chosen to be conducted, chosen, chosen for this particular research to be collected data from. So number one, they had a docile nature. They were calm, not the aggressive ones. Of course, you wouldn't want to conduct research on aggressive ones. Number two, they were not pregnant and they did not have a current calf. They were not nursing a calf and they weren't pregnant. Number three, they were, they had a willing mayhout or the handler. Of course, uh, a handler would be necessary over here. And, uh, the what would be the role of the handler? I mean, the handler would be typically taking care of these elephants that the way he uh, usually does. But at the same time, while collecting data, having a handler available over here or having a mehout available over over in 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 that uh, 
at the particular site or location is pretty essential uh, concerning the uh, safety of the researchers. Of course, the researchers, the researchers were researchers. I mean, uh, despite of the amount of uh, love Dr. Fagan had uh, or has towards animals, she wouldn't, I, I'm, I'm sure she wouldn't really have a lot of experience with uh, elephants and elephants. You wouldn't know elephants are huge. They're humongous. They could potentially be dangerous. So having a willing mehout was pretty essential, right? So if you choose a particular, the staff chooses a particular elephant and the mehout is uh, uh, not really uh, uh, ready to participate in that particular study or written, is not really ready to help, uh, is not really ready to make the elephant participate in that study, of course, you would let go of that elephant. So prior to the study, they had been they had been trained using traditional methods and in free contact, right? We're talking about free contact over here. So I'm marking this here, I'll tell you ahead why. The next one, they had never been exposed to training methods according to the staff. So these were the five different criteria that I'd want all of you to keep in mind. Number one, an elephant would be chosen to be uh, conducted this research on if the animal is of a calm, docile nature. Number two, the animal shouldn't be, the elephant in this case shouldn't be pregnant or shouldn't have, shouldn't be nursing a calf. Number three, the handler or the mehout should be uh, ready to, uh, to, 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 uh, to voluntarily help in uh, terms of collecting, in terms of uh, training first and then collecting data. Number four, all of these uh, elephants, the elephants that were being chosen, they were all trained previously through traditional methods, right? That were based more on aversive stimuli or punishment, right? And in free contact, for free contact, in other words, there was no restriction in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, of course, for this particular study, when we talk about the usage of SPR, we'd be noting down the time taken for training procedure as well. Free contact is no restrictions, no limitations whatsoever. And uh, the, 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 through the daily routine, these elephants were trained. Number five, they had never been exposed to SPR training methods. So these were the five different criteria. Now, if we have a look at the a question that related to this that we could possibly get in our CIs, describe how Fagan et al. elephant learning recruited a sample of participants and explain why she decided to recruit in this way. Now she, uh, uh, describe how they were recruited, right? You could add these parts and why the the, the recruitment one uh, the recruitment was done in this particular way. So this is a four mark question. You get you keep two marks in mind for this and two marks in mind for this. That's how you get your marks for this particular four mark question, right? Now taking this further ahead, I want you all to have a bit more of an understanding of what actually happened during this research. So, of course, we're talking about animals, we're talking about elephants, and these elephants would have to be going for their grazing sessions. The elephants spent around seven and a half hours a day grazing in the jungle under the control of the mehouts, of course. They had two grazing sessions in a day from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. to 10 uh, to 4 p.m., right? So the, there were two grazing sessions that these uh, uh, elephants had, and they were from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. and from 10.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., right? You add the time together, this makes around seven and a half hours. They used to go to graze in the wild, along with other elephants, uh, of course, under the supervision of their mayhouts, where they'd have uh, uh, ample to eat, and they'd have uh, ample of water drink to water to drink from as well. Now these were the grazing or outdoor sessions, right? On the other hand, we refer to, we talk about stable sessions, which are uh, could be referred to as the indoor sessions as well, right? Now, if you talk about these uh, stable sessions between and after grazing sessions, right? After grazing sessions, of course, if they're going out for grazing from uh, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning, right? And if you see from 7 a.m. to till 10.30 p.m., that makes it good about three, three and a half hours, right? So three, three and a half hours between these two sessions and could be after uh, the second session, after the second session, uh, after the second grazing session as well, that is after 4 p.m., right? So grazing sessions were for around seven and a half hours and the stable sessions now between and after the grazing sessions the elephants 
were secured. These elephants were secured with long chains to post and open stalls for the rest of the day and night in the stable. So they were free during this time. However, when they were back at the stable, they were secured with leg chains to post and open stalls for the rest of the day and night in the stable. Typically, the leg chains place were placed on both front legs together or on a single front leg with a chain about 6 to 8 feet. That makes it 1.8 to 2.4 meters long connecting them to the post. So these uh, elephants, they had uh, quite of uh, uh, space to move around, around. I mean, not a lot, but then again, six to eight feet is uh, the uh, area that they could move around. This, uh, even when being chained, this setup allowed enough slack for the elephants to move in a circle with a diameter of six to eight feet around there, uh, around this stall. This shouldn't be stake, this should be stall. So this is the stall we're talking about, right? Where they were, uh, where they were, where they were, we call it uh, chained up to with. So we know about the grazing sessions now, we know about the stable sessions now, right? And we know the difference between them. Okay, now one more thing, it's not really written over here, but I'd like to add it up. The data was collected, data collection was done. Along with the data collection, the training, the training and data collection, it was both done over here when the animals were at the stable, okay? Now next we speak about husbandry conditions. What does the word husbandry over here mean? Husbandry in this context refers to the living conditions of these animals, right? These elephants. So the elephant's diet, and this is pretty essential. You could link it with animal ethics, ethics or uh, ethical guidelines for animals. You get questions on this as well. So the elephant's diet mainly consisted of, we're talking about the diet first. It mainly consisted of fresh grass and dana, that is packets of grain, nutrition, supplements, and grasses. So it was typically fresh grass from their grazing sessions, I'd like to assume. And they had, they were given dana, that is packets of grain, nutritional supplements, as well as grasses, right? So while grazing, they had access to the river for water. So while grazing, they had access to the river for water. We could link this water part to this, the grazing sessions, okay? Now, however, but water was not provided outside of the training protocol. These husbandry or living conditions were standard at the stable and no changes were specifically made for the study. So a typical question that we could get in terms of the ethical guidelines for animals could also uh, be linked to how their daily lives were being disrupted, right? Now, their daily lives, keeping in mind their, uh, their, 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 their routine, their daily routine, right? Their daily routine was uh, not really affected, uh, especially their uh, grazing sessions, right? So these uh, husbandry living con or living conditions were standard at the stable and no changes were specifically made for the study. No changes were specifically made for this particular study. It's pretty important that we note this down over here, taking this ahead. So my dear, we were talking about this study that was conducted by Fagan et al. This was published in 2014. This has to do with uh, elephant learning. This has to do with using alternative positive reinforcement techniques to help these uh these uh these elephants with uh, with 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 the with with the, uh, the collection of sample to test them for tuberculosis because tuberculosis is also referred to as tb is dangerous right we had initially spoken about the psychology that was being investigated in this particular study then we moved on we spoke of the background we moved on we spoke of the aim we moved on we spoke about the research method and design we spoke about the sample and now we move on towards the procedure for this particular research now, if you remember the SPR technique that we had spoken about earlier, in this study, the training method used was the SPR technique, right? SPR was used over here. What does SPR stand for? SPR is secondary positive, positive reinforcement technique, right? With chopped bananas as the main reinforcer, that is the positive reinforcer or rather say the primary reinforcer. The primary reinforcer, the primary reinforcer. 
as the main reinforcer reward and a short whistle as a secondary reinforcer that is it's written there but i just write it down over here as a secondary reinforcer so we are talking about this being the primary reinforcer and this being a secondary reinforcer so the training method was SPR with chopped bananas as the main reinforcer and a short whistle blow as a secondary reinforcer. Training, training took place during the indoor sessions, that is the stable sessions. During the stable sessions. The training took place during indoor sessions from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Remember before this, the elephants would leave for the grazing sessions and from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. That is after the second grazing uh, session. Now, the trainer, uh, yeah, the trainer conducted the sessions with the Mehout present. Of course, the presence of the Mehout was pretty essential over here because of safety concerns, safety of the trainer, right? But uh, remember, if the Mehout is uh, present in the at the particular site, at the particular location, there's a possibility that the Mehout's uh, presence over here could affect the responses of the uh, elephants, right? So in order to ensure that this does not happen, there were certain controls that were uh, uh, taken care of, right? So the trainer conducted the sessions with the Mehout's present for safety, but the Mehout didn't speak or signal the elephants. No elephant, the Mehout was just present there for safety concerns, but the mayout was not allowed to speak or signal the elephant which they uh, which they followed which they adhered to right so none of the mayout signaled or spoke to the uh, animals during the training or the uh, what do you call it the testing sessions right no elephant went more than 2 days without a training session now uh, a a question over here could be were the training sessions what did every elephant did each elephant uh, go through a training session every day no they did not due to the uh availability of the mayhouts right there were days when a particular mayhout would not be available or free at that particular time there were uh, some animals who did not uh there were there were there were there were some elephants who did not get trained every single day nonetheless no elephant went more than two days without a training session and the elephants had an option to the elephants had an option to not participate by turning or walking away from the trainer. They had an option of not participating to, again, an ethical guideline of an ethical guideline for animals being followed over here, right? So the animals, the elephants in this case, did have an option of uh, not participating in the study. They could simply turn away or walk away from the trainer. Now, the goal of the training was to teach the elephants to voluntarily perform a trunk wash in several steps, actively moving their trunk in response to a particular cue. Now, what sort of cues are we talking about? The behavior, the, be <coughs> the sequence of behaviors that formed a successful trunk wash. Now, we know this is the studies about a trunk wash. Let me take you back to where we took a start from. Let's have a look at the title again. Here you go, right? Positive reinforcement training for a trunk wash in Nepal's working elephants, demonstrating alternatives to traditional elephant training techniques. Okay. Taking this ahead. Yeah. So the sequence of behaviors that formed a successful trunk wash that needed to be taught to the elephant was as follows. Number one, this is the sequence, and you could possibly get a question on this as well. Place the end of the trunk in the hand of the trainer right place the end of the trunk in the hand of the trainer i don't know how to do it but if this is the hand of the trainer this is the animal's trunk right the place the trunk in the hand of the trainer i'll you'd you'd learn why this was required in the following slides the first step place the end of the trunk in the hand of the trainer number two Allow the trainer to insert saline or plain sterile uh, sterile water into the trunk, right? Nine. Allow the trainer to insert saline or saline or plain sterile water into the trunk. Now, 
this is the hand of the trainer. This is the trunk, right? So the first step is placing the trunk over here. Number two, allowing the trainer to insert saline solution. Number two, number three, lift the trunk up so the liquid went into the base of the trunk, right? So if this is the uh, trunk, this uh, pencil that I have in my hand, if this is the trunk, you lift it up so that, uh, I mean, after you've put in the uh, saline solution, the uh, elephant was expected to lift up the trunk so that it goes all the way down, right? Lift the trunk up so the liquid went into the base of the trunk, right? Let's just say this is the this red part, this is the base of the trunk, right? So it, the trainer places uh her hand away like this the elephant was trained uh, this was the sequence to use right the elephant was trained to place the trunk over here the saline solution was uh injected over here and then the elephant was expected to lift up this trunk so that the solution could go all the way to the base okay number four hold the liquid in the base of the trunk right so once this goes up the animal the elephant was expected to hold the liquid there then Lower the tip of the trunk into a collection basket. So, yeah, I can't really show this to you. So there was a basket. There was uh, a, or rather say a bucket that was available there. And then blow out the sample of liquid. Now, these six steps, kindly keep them in, the, in your mind. The sequence of behaviors that formed a successful trunk wash. The sequence of behaviors that formed a successful trunk wash it had it, this sequence uh, comprised of six different steps over here. And the first one, place the end of the trunk in the hand of the trainer. Number two, allow the trainer to insert saline or plain sterile water in the trunk. Number three, lift the trunk up so the liquid went in the base of the trunk. Number four, hold the liquid in the base of the trunk. Number five, lower the tip of the trunk into a collection bucket. Number six, blow out the uh, sample of liquid so that it will be tested later. This had to be in succession. So no liquid missed the collection device and the elephant did not swallow the liquid, right? This had to be in succession, one step after another so that no liquid missed the collection device, that is the bucket. And the elephant did not swallow the liquid because it had to be tested. The idea of the sequence is based on the elephant being active and not passive. Now you guys could, of course, the elephant is being active over here because the quite a chunk of the work that is to be done over here is being done by the elephant and this is what they're being trained for now you could uh, possibly get a question uh something similar to this the question could say from the study by figan it all elephant learning describe the sequence of training behaviors that formed a successful trunk wash that needed to be taught to the elephants you could answer it like this this is not a sample answer this is not a sample answer this is just to hint you on the sort of questions you could get and how you could possibly answer it a frequently asked question over here is can we write an answer in points uh, yes you can however had i been a student i would have uh, formed it into a paragraph so in the training for the trunk wash using voluntary methods, the elephant had to follow a series of steps. This included putting the end of a trunk in the trainer's hand, letting the trainer put saline or sterile water in the trunk, lifting the trunk up to let the fluid flow the base of the trunk, holding the fluid there, and then lowering the trunk's tip into a collection container to blow out the sample. It was important for all these tasks to happen smoothly in order to avoid losing any fluid on the ground and the elephant was not supposed to drink the solution. Now, how are we marked on questions like this? Do you realize the content that you see over here is the same as you have the content on, on the left side in points, right? How you typically are marked on is the examiner, what the examiner does is the examiner would pick up four appropriate points from here from this particular paragraph the examiner would pick up of course for this particular paragraph there are more than four points this is just to give you an idea about how the stuff that you see over here how the content that you see over here in points could actually be written down in a paragraph but then again uh, how you'd be marked is on the basis of the correct points that you write what i suggest uh, students to do over here is if you know of more points uh uh, write, write, try writing more than four points. If it's a four mark question, try writing around four to five to, or five to six points. Just in case if there's uh, any point that is uh, deemed to be inappropriate or is incorrect, you could get marked for the other points that you've written. Again, all of this depends on how well you've learned the study. So you need to learn your studies really well. Taking this ahead. After establishing the marker reward relationship, the marker reward relationship that is between the banana and the whistle, the banana being the primary reinforcer and the whistle being the secondary reinforcer. 
elephants were taught using the following three methods. Now, we need to understand what the word capture would mean over here, what the word lure would mean, and what the word shaping would mean. The capture technique is a good way to begin training. And now we 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 moving on towards the training phase, right? How exactly were these elephants trained? The capture technique is a good way to begin training an animal for a behavior. It naturally does and for a behavior that an animal naturally does or something similar to a spontaneous behavior like a dog sitting. In this method, the trainer waits for the animal to perform the natural behavior on its own and then consistently marks and rewards it. Now, when you talk about uh, the uh the when 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 we talk about this particular uh, method that is capture this particular training method that is capture being used over here you know the example that we have over here is about a dog sitting you want to train a dog to sit you know dog a dog would a dog would sit otherwise too even if the dog is not being trained the dog can't be standing the entire day or night right so a dog would sit if you want to train the dog when the dog does sit on its own right so it's a behavior that the dog does naturally right when the dog sits on its own you reward the dog right you reward the dog so that you are so that so that so that you're you're uh you're uh trying so that you're able to form an association right between that particular behavior and the reward uh that is being given to the dog in this case right so the capture technique what is this capture technique this makes use of any particular behavior that the animal in this case uh, a technique uh, or a capture technique is a technique that makes use of any particular behavior that an animal would uh, naturally do and when that animal naturally does that the trainer rewards that animal right when the trainer rewards that animal the dog would the animal would start associating that particular reward with that behavior so the next time they'd uh, want that particular reward they probably want they probably know for a fact that it was this behavior that led to them being rewarded right so that was capture number one number two we talk about your when dealing with behaviors that aren't natural so this compared to this, this over here, we're talking about natural behavior. And in the second example, that is Leo, we're talking about behavior that is not natural, right? So when dealing with behaviors that aren't natural for an animal, the Leo technique can be employed. In this method, a reward is strategically placed to guide the animal into a desired body position. Now, if you want, now, of course, we're talking about now that you have a know-how about this particular study, you know that it is uh the, you know about the involvement of the uh trunk of the elephant in this uh, uh particular study when you talk about the leo technique it has to do with behaviors that aren't natural right so if you if you would want the elephant to behave or to uh to 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 to, to be in a particular body position right you would lure the animal towards doing that this rewarded body position becomes the starting point for working on the desired behavior. For instance, remember, you wanted, uh, remember, if you remember, I'd given you the example of when the uh, researcher would place her hand and the animal was expected to put her tongue, uh, sorry, not her tongue, her trunk, right, her trunk in uh, uh, on her hand, right? So if the animal is placing its trunk on the hand, right, the, what the researcher did was the researcher would keep chopped bananas over here, right? The researcher would keep chopped bananas here. If there are chopped bananas over here, that would be a positive reinforcer for the animal, right? So when dealing with behaviors that aren't natural, when de dealing with behaviors that aren't natural, the Leo technique can be employed. In this method, a reward is strategically placed to guide the animal into a desired body position. The rewarded, the rewarded body position becomes a starting point for working on the desired behavior, right? So you ought to ensure that the animal is in the uh, desired uh, body position for that so that the so that the next step would be to make the animal do what you're wanting the animal to do right so number three and in this case it was placing the trunk over here i'm just giving an example placing the trunk and on the hand uh, so that you could uh, put uh, the what do you call it saline solution now the third uh, method shaping 
Once the training begins with either the capture or lure technique, it frequently progresses with shaping. Shaping takes advantage of the natural variations in the quality of behavior during repetition. Now, I'd like to use uh, the example of uh, from this uh, particular study again. Now, remember uh, the eventually what the animal, uh, what the elephant had to do was I just take a step back, take you a step back. So eventually the uh, elephant was expected to lower the tip of the trunk into a collection bucket, blow out the sample of liquid, right? You're training a non-human primate, you're training an elephant to lower its trunk into the collection bucket and then exhale or blow out the sample of the liquid, right? Now, when you talk about this third, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, method, that is the shaping technique, over here, of course, if you wait, while you're training the animal to do this, while you're training the elephants to do this, you can't really expect the elephant to blow out or exhale liquid uh, in an accurate manner the first time you make it do it, the first time you make it do it, right? You cannot expect that to happen. So every time you, uh, uh, if, you if you remember at the beginning, what I said was what you do is you, uh, keep on raising the bar, right? You keep on raising the standard. So the first time the animal might not be uh, very good at uh, what do you call it, aiming at the bucket while exhaling. So slowly and gradually, you would move one step after another to another, to another, to another, to the point that the animal or the elephant learns how to exhale in that bucket, right? Properly or accurately, so that they less of spillage, less of sample being wasted. Once the training begins with either the capture or lure technique, it frequently progresses with shaping. Shaping takes advantage of the natural variations in the quality of behavior during repetition, right? I'm sticking to the same example of elephants, right? The variations in the quality of behavior during repetition, right? The first time the uh, elephant might not, not, not be able to do it the right way. The second time it might keep on getting better and better and better and better. The method involves rewarding, rewarding only the behaviors that are closer to the ultimate goal. Gradually rewarding these best behaviors helps move the average responses closer to the desired goal, right? This would slowly and gradually help you get to that rewarded, uh, to get to that desired behavior, right? Now, what was, uh, what is it that we discussed on this particular slide? Like I said, after establishing the marker reward relationship, that is banana and whistle, elephants were taught using the following three methods that are capture, lure, and shaping right all three of them were used now what were the tasks using these training methods elephants were trained to do the following behavioral tasks separately the trunk wash consisted of five different tasks number one trunk here this see trunk here i've been doing this over and over again i hope you understand this is the hand that signifies the hand of the trainer the researcher right this is the trunk number two trunk up this i'm sure helps you understand this better number three the bucket you aim at the bucket right number four you blow or you exhale and the fifth one is steady which is not pictured over here so again you could possibly get a question that would say uh that might say from the study by fagan et al elephant learning outline two features of training tasks used in the study training tasks these are five different training training tasks that were present there that the elephant had to go through. Taking this ahead, let's talk about the behavioral tasks and methods that were taught to the elephants. Now, there were five different uh, tasks. Let's number them first, and then let's start discussing them one at a time. One trunk here, two trunk up, three bucket, four blow, five steady. This is what we're talking about. Tuck, 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 right? Now, the behavioral task trunk here, what was the role it had in the trunk wash? This would allow the saline solution or water to be instilled into the trunk, right? The description of this, the elephant places end of the trunk into the trainer's hand. And I have explained this to you quite a lot of times. The method that was used over here was lured. The chopped banana was placed in trainer's hand, right? This was a reward. Number two, trunk up. The role in the trunk wash now, this to allow saline or water to run to the base of the trunk. Elephants lifts, elephant lifts trunk upwards. What technique was used over here? The lure and the shaping technique, both. 
The trainer lifts chopped banana above the hand so elephants reach the trunk upwards. Something like this, right? I hope this helps you understand this better. Number three, the bucket. To allow placement of trunk into bucket ready to exhale. Ready to exhale, okay? You haven't, the elephant hasn't exhaled as yet. So uh, the description elephant places end of the trunk in bucket. The lure technique was used over here. Chopped banana were placed at the bottom of the bucket. I probably have a picture of this to show you. I don't think I do here. So yeah, anyways. So the lure technique, this, if this is the bucket, I'm not very good with drawing. So you had chopping bananas right at the bottom. This would, again, you're luring the animal, the elephant to behave in the way, in the way you'd want it to behave. Blow, to exhale the sample for collection, right? Exhaling the sample for collection. Elephant exhales through the trunk, uh, exhales through trunk in the bucket, capture and shaping, wait for natural exhale and reward, then shape with further reward for more forceful exhale. Now you're moving on. See over here, you had lure, you had lure and shaping, lure, capture and shaping now. And the last one, steady to allow the elephant to hold any position for the required amount of time, right? So it could be, let's just say a vertical, uh, rather say a horizontal if this is the trunk, right, the animal uh, holds the trunk in this particular steady position, right? Uh, there were instances where the, uh, they were the, these elephants, they were made to hold their trunk uh, parallel to the ground as well. If this is the ground, right, it would be, if this is the ground, it would be parallel to the ground. So to allow the elephant to hold any position for the required amount of time, elephants hold the position they have been previously asked to do. So here you go. Method use, shaping, extending the period of time, the position of behavior that was held for that particular reward. So my dear, these were the five different behavioral tasks and methods that were taught to the elephants. To name them, we had trunk here, trunk up, bucket, blow, steady. Let's do this again. Trunk here, trunk up, bucket, blow, steady, right? I hope you've understood the role all of these behavioral tasks have had played you've understood the description part and the method that was used over here as well taking this ahead this could be another question that would be a part of your uh, examination in the study by fagan all at all elephant learning describe how the elephants were trained to do to do each of the basic behavioral tasks see there were this if this is a five mark question i'll show you one oh wait let me pick up another color one, two, three, four, five. But all of this has been written in a paragraph, right? So in the study by Fagan et al, elephant learning describe how the elephants were trained to do each of the basic behavioral tasks. In the training process, the elephant learned various behaviors for trunk washing. For trunk here, the elephant delicately placed the end of her trunk in the trainer's hand, initially guided by a banana lure and later refined for specific placement trunk up involved the elephant lifting a trunk to facilitate uh, the flow of saline trained through a combination of leo techniques with bananas and shaping for height adjustments number three bucket saw the elephant uh, uh, putting her trunk in a bucket for blowing initially lured with a banana and subsequently marked and awarded the blow behavior required the elephant to exhale forcefully through her trunk for sample collection with training focusing on capturing nature uh, natural exhales and shaping for increased force. Lastly, the steady behavior involved the elephant holding a position after being asked, trained through shaping for extended holding time with a specific hand cue. The repetition of the behavior was marked and the primary reinforcer was given upon completion. So you are, again, let me repeat, this is not a sample answer. I don't believe in sample answers. This is just to give you a hint on how how you'd write of course this might take uh because in your ci's for a five mark question you'd have 10 lines this might take a lot more lines so you just squeeze it and uh, make sure that you're not missing on anything important one two three four and five taking this ahead now during it during training there were three additional tasks we spoke about five tasks right there are three more but do not worry they weren't they were initially introduced, but later on dropped off. So you don't need to worry. They wouldn't really affect the results here though. So during, during training, there were three additional tasks that is targeting trunk down and trunk out. They were introduced, but later dropped because they weren't essential, essential for the trunk wash. So the researchers initially introduced them, but the letter decided to let go of them. After the elephant 
mastered individual behaviors. Each task was linked to a simple one syllable cue with no meaning in English or Nepali, ensuring it had no significance for the elephants or the mehals. Now, once the elephants had mastered these individual behaviors, these five individual tasks that we spoke about, each task was linked to or uh, given, uh, there was an association found with a one syllable cue, which was neither in English nor in Nepalese. Why though? Because there was a possibility that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the elephants might have uh, understood that particular word of their, or they had, uh, if they had heard that particular word earlier, they might, uh, this, this would eventually affect the findings of the research. So a uh, one syllable cue was uh, chosen, which had no meaning in either English or Nepalese, right? Now, Number three, once all the behaviors were set, trainers combined them. The trainers combined them in short sequences using a technique called behavioral chaining. Here we go. The terms that we had discussed right at the beginning, behavioral chaining, one, uh, the completion of one task, uh, uh, the completion of one task leading to another, the second completion of second task leading to another, tuck, 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 tuck. So, and the elephant being rewarded towards the end. Once all the behaviors were set, trainers were combined. Trainers combined them in short sessions, short sequences using a technique called behavioral chaining. This method involved correctly performing the first behavior, giving the animal the chance to do the next one right and receive a reward. So initially there were short sequences, and then uh, towards the end it was all combined together because all of these those sequences they had to be done together for a successful trunk wash. Now, initially separate tasks were paid. This is what we just read. I just said, initially separate tasks were paid starting with bucket and blow. Then they were combined into longer sequence until they performed the entire trunk wash procedure. So initially there were short sessions followed by longer sessions and eventually till they formed the entire trunk washing procedure. So short sessions moving to long sessions, moving to the entire procedure being done in one go. Now, the procedure for the behavioral chaining was as follows. Now, many of you might find this uh, pretty elaborated, pretty extensive. But uh, yeah, the examiner, when you're sitting for your examination, the examiner asks you specific content, right? I could get through the entire thing in half of the amount of time that I'm taking right now, but I don't want to. I don't want to cover the study. Uh, uh, in a superficial manner, I would, because this has details, of course, the things that we're discussing right now, I did not make them up or I did not come up with them on my own. I'm discussing them because they're there. So if they're there, there's a possibility you might as well be tested on this. So yeah, as much as the time this is taking us to finish this particular study, trust me, it is worth it. Now, the procedure for the behavioral chaining was as follows. Number one, the elephant was rewarded for blows made towards any part of the bucket. This was then shaped so that rewards only occurred with blowing aimed at the center of the bottom of the bucket. Does this remind you of shaping? One. Number two, separate behaviors were paired in a range of combinations and were practiced in multiple behavioral Sequences working towards the full trunk wash. Number three, the trainer used a marker that is a whistle at appropriate stages of the sequence, but the primary reinforcer of banana was only ever given at the end of the correct sequence. The final stage was to chain together the full trunk wash sequence of trunk here, short, steady, trunk up, long, steady, bucket, and then blow. So, Next, let's talk about the usage of syringe. Yes, a syringe was used over here, and syringes are could be could be could be could could be scary, and uh, they could they scare humans, they scare many humans, and they could scare the elephant too. So of course, this was done through the desensitization procedure. Why was the syringe being used over here? Remember, we're talking about the saline solution that was required, right? And uh, sterile water so in addition the trainer also introduced the use of syringe to the trunk here position this was the trunk here position okay this was done incrementally 
using a desensitization method. So what is a desensitization method? You go step by step, right? You wouldn't just uh, bring the uh, syringe right in front of the, what do you call it, uh, the, 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 the elephant right away. You don't want to scare the animal, right? So in addition, the trunk, the trainer also introduced the use of uh, introduce the use of a syringe to truncular position. This was done incrementally using a desensitization method that is going step by step, step gradually introducing the syringe. Why though? Because you don't want to scare uh, the, the, the animal, right? Over a series of repetition, over a series of repetitions of the whole trunk wash sequence, the syringe was gradually brought closer to the elephant's trunk then touching the trunk, then inserted, then inserted with the increasing amount of fluid until the elephant tolerated the full 60 milliliter required for sample collection. Let me just put points, uh, numbers over here. So one, you bring the injection closer to the elephant's trunk, then you touch the trunk, then you insert it, then you insert with increasing amount of fluid, which range from one milliliter to 15 milliliter at a single uh, point until the elephant tolerated the full 60 milliliter required for sample collection. So how much was required for sample collection? 60 milliliter. Frequently asked question, do we need to learn this? Of course you do. Quantitative data is questioned on. So it's it's good, it's good. And I don't think it's difficult. We can learn it together. So let's learn it together. One to 15 milliliter at a point in terms of increments, and eventually it was the total amount of liquid that was required for data collection was 60 milliliters, right? So I learned it. I hope you learned it too. Taking this ahead, all elephants were started uh, on 0.9% saline as the sample medium. They were then transitioned to plain water for training purposes. So initially they introduced the saline solution and then for training purposes, they moved on to plain water. To avoid elephants drinking the saline or water, they were offered water before each training session. You don't want to, you don't want the elephant to drink away the saline solution or uh, the water during the training or the testing procedure. So in order to avoid this, uh, avoid this from happening, these elephants were offered drinks before each training session. One, Elephant preferred drinking saline and would drink the saline solution after rejecting the drinking water. So was switched to a water solution for the behavioral task. So remember, my dear, we are talking about five different uh, elephants over here, five different female elephants that were uh, used for this particular study. Let me remind you, four of them were juveniles. One of them was an adult elephant. Amongst the four juvenile elephants, one of them would prefer, show preference towards drinking saline solution and would drink the saline solution after rejecting the drinking the water. So they quickly switch to water solution for the behavioral task for that particular uh, elephant, right? You did not, the researchers taken it all, they uh, did not want the elephant, the baby elephant to be drinking the saline solution. That was for the collection of the sample. So there was no time limit put on any stage. Of course, you're dealing with animals of the training process. You know, these minute details, it's good that you know them because uh, the way the examiner asks you questions, it's, it's, it's pretty essential that you know all of this. There was no time limit put on any stage of the training process. It was determined by the success of the individual elephant, meaning that the training plans varied according to the individual elephant's needs. Are we talking about flexibility here? Flexibility, is it a good thing? Oh, yes, it is. Is it a bad thing? It could be because if there's flexibility, your research would lack standardization. So yeah, these steps, taking this ahead, how was data collected here? So my dear, the data was collected in terms of uh, three, we do uh, in, uh, in terms of three different categories. Number one, we'd speak about session times. Number two, number of offers. Number three, performance tests. tests. Session time. During training sessions, an assistant carefully measured the duration beginning when the first cue was given and concluding when the elephant's response to the final cue. If a session could be accurately timed, couldn't be accurately timed, perhaps due to limited staff, any missing data points would be placed with the average minutes per session for that specific elephant. So data was collected through three main categories. Number one, session times. The time taken during a session, right? During training sessions, an assistant carefully measured the duration of the uh, that particular session, right? 
this duration uh, began with the first cue that was given and concluded with the elephant's response to the final cue. So the time between the first cue and the final cue was measured by the assistant. However, there were some instances where the timing of a session was not accurately uh, measured or noted. Now, why is it that the timing of the uh, why is it that the timing of the uh, why is it that the timing of the uh, the, the, the session was not accurately noted. Perhaps this was because of uh, lack of uh, uh, resources, manpower, right? And limited amount of uh, staff that being available, which led to some of the sessions timings not being noted accurately too. Nonetheless, this was taken care of. Any missing data points were replaced with the average minutes per session for that specific Elephant. So, what of the sessions were who that's uh, whose timing were not noted down? The researchers they used the average for that specific elephant. Number two, number of offers in every session, an assistant counted how many times the elephant was prompted to perform a specific behavior, marking it as the number of offers for that behavior. Now, what is number of offers? The times the elephant was prompted to perform a specific behavior. This count included instances during desensitization and the early stages of learning a new task, even when no particular response was anticipated and before the verbal cue had been associated with the behavior. So, my dear, the timings of the sessions was noted, the number of offers were noted, and then comes the most important one, that is the performance tests. Starting from session 10, now remember, these uh, elephants, they were trained first and then they were tested, right? So how often did the testing take place? Let me repeat, all of these elephants, they were trained first and then they were tested, right? So the testing start, the testing did not start till the 10th uh, training session. So once there were 10 training sessions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, once there were 10 training sessions, then the researchers started testing these uh, elephants. So Starting from session 10, a test was given to each elephant roughly every five sessions, roughly flexibility, flexibility, right? So roughly uh, every five sessions after sessions 10, 15, 20, etc., allowing for some flexibility. Tests were administered until the session 10. Tests weren't administered, I'm sorry. Tests weren't administered until the session 10 because the researchers wanted the elephants to grasp the training approach during the initial session for learning the basic tasks. So till the 10th session, no elephant was tested. The researchers chose not to do this because the researchers wanted the elephants to grasp the training approach during the initial sessions before the learning, uh, before, before the testing could take place. During each test, elephants were assessed on all the behaviors they had been taught with a passing score set at 80% or higher. Operationalization. So during each test, the passing marks, as you students typically refer to it as, during each test, elephants were assessed on all the behaviors they had been taught with a passing score set at 80% or higher. This was the cutoff criteria. This was how the passing was operationalized right uh yeah uh higher operationalization for each task eight or more correct out of 10 offers that makes it 80 percent if an elephant hadn't learned a behavior yet it wasn't tested and the elephant received a default score of zero in the records right so if a uh, uh, if an elephant did not learn that particular behavior it was not tested and by default that particular elephant was given a zero the, dem the determination of whether a behavioral response during the test was considered passing was subjective and described as of sufficient quality to function in trunk wash as decided by the trainer. So the, this, the trainer was eventually deciding if the uh, way that particular behavior has been, uh, 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 the, the, if, if the, it was the trainer that was deciding or determining that a particular behavioral response would be uh would 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 be good enough to be considered as passing or not passing. So the determination of whether a behavioral response during the test was considered passing was subjective and described as of sufficient quality of function in a trunk wash. This is important to 
Now, who decides this? The trainer gets to decide this. And if the trainer gets to decide this, subjectivity could be a problem. Taking this ahead, moving on towards the result of this research. I'm sure many of you would be exhausted by now a bit more and then we'd be through. So mind you, we're talking about the study that was conducted by Fake and AOL that was conducted in 2014. We had started off with the study with the psychology being investigated. We moved on towards discussing the background, the aim, the research method and design, the sample, the procedure. And we divided the procedure into two different parts to be initially uh, task parts to two different parts. We initially spoke about the tasks and then we spoke about data collection. And now we move on towards the results of this particular study. Now, if we have a look at the results of this particular study, we'd I'd like to broadly put the results of the study into two uh, different headings as well. Number one, let's talk about trunk wash learning. And number two, we talk about individual task tests. If you have a look at the results of the study. Okay, before this, uh, do you need to learn numbers it's good you do because uh, not always, but you do get tested in your CIs and knowing numbers would help you score better. So, and uh, how would there have been certain instances where the uh, examiner has very specifically mentioned that uh, numeric data has to be uh, added to the answer. So if we have a look at the results, the, uh, the four juvenile elephants successfully learned the trunk wash in the study time frame yay so yes it did work on four of juvenile elephants wait we had five of them in total four of them were juvenile or young elephants and one of them was an adult elephant the result just talks about four juvenile elephants being successful in learning the trunk wash in the study's time frame however the adult elephant that is elephant five did not grasp all the necessary components for the trunk wash here. Next, specific achievements include elephant two passing after 25 sessions. That was a quick one. On, and it took 10.29 minutes per session. However, elephant one after 30 sessions, that is 12.42 minutes per session and elephant three and four after 35 sessions, and this was the time that they took, or average time that they took. So the quickest one or the smartest one was elephant two, then was elephant one, and then it was elephant three and four. Elephant two took 25 sessions, elephant one took 30 sessions, and elephant three and four took 35 sessions each. This was the amount of time per session that they took. However, for the fifth elephant, the fifth elephant wasn't able to get through now moving on towards uh yeah elephant five was elephant five was never tested on the trunk wash due to incomplete understanding remember this i don't know if you remember so yeah you'd be given a default score of zero if you're not getting through moving on individual task tests right so all elephants completed tests for individual tasks before or during the final sessions. So they all completed their tests for individual tasks before and during the final sessions. Elephant five, elephant five faced challenges and did not pass tests for blowing into the bucket. Desensitization to the syringe and steady behavior. All we could do is feel sad about this and nothing more. Elephant two and four struggled with the steady test despite passing their full trunk wash test. So they overall, they were passing through it. Nonetheless, they were struggling with the steady test. Success in individual, success in individual behavioral tests depended on task difficulty and when they introduced during training. So the success of an individual behavior depended on the difficulty of the task, how difficult the task was, and when it was introduced during the training. The task's difficulty was reflected in the number of attempts required before achieving a passing score and performance task. So the more time elephants took to pass the test, the more uh, difficult that particular task would be considered. Indicating the practice needed for tasks reliability. 
these were my dear the results of this particular study now uh, this uh, table that we have in front of us would help us understand these results better the data that you see written over here is the data that you came across over here it's pretty simple it's just written in order so that it helps you with the learning we had five different elephants four of them were juveniles and the fifth one was an adult you see a uh, number of sessions not available not available written over here because uh, because 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 uh, uh, this uh, fifth uh, elephant the adult elephant did not pass now the total uh, training time in minutes that was uh, taken by these elephants we know elephant two was the quickest taking it ahead another result was that some behavioral tasks were more difficult than others for example the trunk here task required more offers or cues than the bucket or blow into bucket tasks additional information for results the elephants gradually improved their performance over time the mean success rate went from 39 percent after 10 sessions to 89.3 percent after 35 sessions of training mean percentage score never reached 100 percent as 90 percent was given a default to individual behaviors with a sequence once the sequence was passed so this is important initially after the 10th session remember these elephants were not tested before the 10th session right the first time these animals uh, these elephants were tested were after was after the 10th session so the mean success rate went from 39 percent after the 10th session to 89.3 percent after the uh, 35th session so that's a, that's an amazing success rate we just uh, spoke about the results of this uh, study we just spoke about the significant results of the study we have a couple of graphs over here we'd get through these uh, we'd, we'd, we'd be discussing these uh, graphs uh, really quick and then we'd uh, there are a couple of additional points that i'd want you all to uh, have an idea about or to be keeping in mind then we conclude it and bring the study to an end. So let's have a look at these uh, graphs that we see on the screen first. So yeah, the graph on the left side first. What does this say? The number of sessions needed before each elephant passed her test for the full trunk wash. So if you have a look at this, we these are the number of sessions. This is about the elephants. Elephant one, elephant took a two. Elephant two, if you remember, took the shortest amount of time. 25 sessions for elephant two, uh, 30 sessions for elephant one, and 35 sessions each for elephant three and elephant four. Moving on towards the right side and having a look at the graph that we have on the right side of the screen now, the total minutes of training for each elephant during the course of all sessions. So this is again, pretty similar to what we just spoke about here. So have a look at this, these numbers, we have elephants, we have minutes over here taking this ahead. Now, the mean percent correct among all the elephants overall passing rate for all the tasks during each test. Participant dropout began occurring after 25, session 25 as participants completed their training as their training. So we have the sessions and we have the mean number of correct, uh, correct uh, uh, tasks, uh, the task being correctly performed. Uh, scatter graph over here, taking this ahead, let's, now these points, what are these points? These are a couple of points that I'd want everyone to keep in mind. Let's quickly read through them and then we're done. So what is the project goal? What is the goal of this uh, entire research? To determine if free contact traditionally trained elephants can be taught wash with SPR methods. Number two. Success rate of four out of five elephants show feasibility. It shows that, yes, it is feasible. Number three, the tests improved from around 40% to 90%, indicating effectiveness. So this is what we are talking about. From around 40% to around 90%, from session 10 to session 35. Now, number two, efficacy or efficiency of training. How efficient was this training procedure? Four elephants reliably performed trunk wash in 35 sessions or lesser. Average session time was 12 minutes, showcasing efficiency, showing that this was a pretty efficient measure, way of doing it. Results suggest juvenile elephants can learn in less than a month with short daily sessions. So this is, of course, a short daily session, right? Juvenile elephants, younger elephants, baby elephants. Having a look at the data now, Number of offers needed to pass a test reflects the task's difficulty. Remember, the more, uh, uh, the more, the 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 more, the amount of time it was required for, uh, the amount of attempts 
that an elephant went through before passing a test determined how difficult that particular task was. And this provides guideline for teaching similar elephants in the future. Again, application of psychology to everyday life or the usefulness of this research. Having a look at the data. Next one, factors that affected training time. Prior SPR experience likely speeds up learning. Now, remember all of these five elephants, they did not have any experience. They did not have any SPR experience, right? As per the staff that was present there. Next, lack of fear in taking treats facilitated trunk here behavior. The mayhouts were present. That could possibly be a reason. Severe trunk handling phobia may require extended desensitization. Remember the usage of injection. We had to go step by step. Gradually, the, uh, the, 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 the injection was introduced. The next one, training time varies with trainer experience, reward strength, and the elephant's stress level. So these could be factors that could affect the amount of time uh, an elephant could take uh, for the training process, right? The trainer's experience, the reward, uh, the strength of the reward, how good is the reward, and the elephant's stress level. So uh, there could be multiple other factors as well. Uh, the few other points that I'd want everyone to quickly go through. Side distraction. Distractions like other animals, the tourists and evening meals influence elephants' performance, right? Remember, the elephants' meals, uh, uh, there, was, there, was, there was this... Uh, I remember the elephants were going twice for grazing, right? And when there were, uh, there was this uh, one session, one uh, training session between those two grazing sessions, and the second training session was uh, typically after the second grazing session. So this could have affected the findings too. This reduced uh, reduced distractions could have shortened training time period. So if there weren't these distractions, there was a possibility that uh, the animals could have been trained in even shorter amount of time. Elephants fights challenges here. What was the factors? What could possibly be the factors, the reasons behind elephant five not being able to get through a pass? Elephant five faced distraction faced distractions from a neighboring calf during training. That's unfair. One. Number two, impatience and unfocused behavior coincided with a foot abscess. The adult older uh uh elephant who was in her 50s she wasn't very well too she was ill she had was experiencing a foot abscess number three possible vision impairment and trunk weakness reported by the mayhouts too so number four being an adult in a juvenile group limited learning modifications these little points you know having a know-how of these particular points would enhance your understanding of this particular study now offer variations all elephants received eight to 16 offers in each test except elephant one Elephant one, the youngest, had a pre-planned five of four test due to impatience and declining performance. Methodology considerations, consi criteria for passing a behavioral task relied on subjective trainer assessment. That is why we had referred to this or as being subjective. Number two, suggested improvements included stricter criteria, precise position, positioning parameters, and third-party evaluation of videotaping for objectivity so this is a suggestion that could improve the validity of this research you could possibly get a question that might ask you to suggest what could have been done to improve the validity limited personal and equipment uh, hindered objectivity and data recording accuracy limited personals remember there was there were instances where uh, this time was not recorded wait a minute i chose the session time was not recorded and this was because of there being limited staff right yeah so limited personnel and equipment hindered objectivity and data recording accuracy next steady task challenges steady task criteria did not reflect elephants abilities accurately initial goals were set for trunk up trunk here and trunk down positions most elephants mastered steady for trunk up and trunk here, but struggled in the trunk down position. Emphasis on trunk down training was lacking, impact, uh, impacting success rate. Just give this a read because this, uh, yeah, just, I think this would do, uh, it would do if you just give this a read. So the next one, unused control tasks, trunk down, trunk out and targeting tasks were introduced as control methods. Trunk down was not needed and minimal time was spent on it. Targeting was initially taught to 12 and 5, but deemed unnecessary and not introduced to others. Trunk out task was introduced, but later discontinued as necessary. Next, training efficiency. 
considerations. Minimal effort spent on unused tasks affected total training time. Future studies could explore SPR training in male elephants, different age groups, larger study samples, or various locations. This is important. This would uh, improve the, 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 the generalization of the findings. This would make your, the findings more generalizable and improve the validity of the findings too. Expanding SPR use for veterinary or general management behavior in animal is a potential avenue. Including a control group of traditionally trained elephants in future studies could highlight SPR benefits. So over here, we, uh, we just had one group that was going through these different uh, tasks, right? So if you have a control group that uh, available over there too, which uh, it would help in terms of comparisons being made. A follow-up study could assess welfare impacts comparing traditional and SPR training effects on stress levels and support for veterinary procedures. So these are some suggestions. This, my dear, brings this uh, study to pretty much an end. Let's get through the conclusion part. Fagan et al. concluded that it is feasible to effectively train juvenile free contact traditionally trained elephants in Nepal to voluntarily and reliably participate in a trunk wash using only secondary positive reinforcement techniques. Also, positive reinforcement using shaping and behavioral chaining can teach elephants to successfully engage in a voluntary fall trunk wash to help test for tuberculosis. The researchers concluded from this study that juvenile free contact traditionally trained elephants can be trained to participate in a trunk wash using only SPR training techniques. Moreover, this training can be carried out with the voluntary participation of the elephants, avoiding any sort of punishment to produce reliable results. Now, the conclusion over here is uh, pretty simply stated, and I hope you've all understood this conclusion. If you've understood the results, you must have understood the conclusions real well. Now, there's a lot more that uh, needs to be known about uh, this particular study or any particular study at all. I'll just show you uh, the, uh, the the elements, the elements that you typically tested on in your CI. Just show that to you, and then we'd uh, bring this uh, lesson to an end. So yeah, this has been, uh, there are 12 core studies that we have in total. This has been picked up from the syllabus. All of this is to be known and you can all be tested on this. Make sure that you're reading all of this. There is quite a lot from here that we have discussed, Where uh, whereas there's other, uh, uh, where, whereas uh, there's, there's, there's some stuff that we still need to be taking into account. Uh, we would, I would, I would, I would record another session for you all for that. And I think it has been long enough today. I hope you've all taken notes. If not, you always have an option of uh, re-watching this and learning it uh, all. Remember, make notes, practice questions. There are ample of questions uh, uh, that could be asked on this particular study. And uh, I would I would uh, record a session or two more on this uh, particular study to help you gain a better insight into the strengths, the limitations, the evaluative aspects, the methodological aspects, the, uh, the, the, the application of psychology to everyday life and its connection, the study's connection with the issues and debates. So yeah, it uh, has been a long session, but uh, I hope uh, it has helped. Uh, if there are any concerns, feel free to reach out. Take good care of yourselves. Stay happy, healthy, safe, and protected. Stay humble, spread positivity, spread smiles, and Allah Hafiz.